As we turn now to Afghanistan, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, visited the Afghan capital of Kabul this week and urged the international community not to neglect Afghanistan, where more than half the population is experiencing acute hunger. When the entire attention of the world is focused on Ukraine, and, by the way, on the refugee crisis that Ukraine, the, the Ukraine war is producing, and rightly so, because it's big, it's serious, I thought it was important to pass the message that other situations, which also require political attention and resources, should not be forgotten and neglected, especially Afghanistan. Afghanistan has faced a looming humanitarian crisis since the Taliban took control last August, with millions on the brink of starvation. The U.N. Refugee Agency says 3.4 million Afghans are internally displaced. Another 2.6 million Afghans have fled Afghanistan as refugees. To discuss all of this, we spoke to the award-winning journalist Matthew Akins, contributing writer for The New York Times Magazine, who has reported on the U.S. occupation and war in Afghanistan since 2008. He's written a remarkable new book. It's called the Naked Don't Fear the Water, an underground journey with Afghan refugees. In his New York Times essay, headlined, We've Never Been Smuggled Before, he writes about Afghans who are trying to escape their country as its economy is collapsing. Nermeen Sheikh and I recently interviewed Matthew Akins. I began by asking him to answer a question he poses in his article, who does the West consider worthy of saving? Imagine right now if Ukrainians, instead of being allowed to cross freely into neighboring countries, into the EU, where they don't require visas, imagine if they were being forced to cross the mountains and sea with smugglers and risk their lives just to escape this war. And that, of course, is a situation for Afghans, as it was for Syrians, as it was for people in most conflicts in the world. Um, they're caged in by these borders, they're not able to cross freely without visas. And when I went to Afghanistan this summer and fall, I went to the border with Iran and witnessed a new wave of Afghans who are displaced, who are fleeing their country, and spoke to a young couple there named Jawad and Shukriya, who are the subject of this article that you mentioned. And they had decided to escape the Taliban and were facing this deadly journey through the desert um, in order to reach safety. And that, unfortunately, is a situation for Afghans. And Matt, uh, uh, on the question of uh, uh, refugees and where Afghan refugees uh, have been able to enter, uh, the vast majority of which were in, uh, of whom were in Afghanistan, uh, sorry, in Pakistan and in Iran. Uh, but then more recently, uh, it's been harder for them to even enter those countries. Yeah, and they, they, need, they need visas in most cases, um, and they're not easy to get. The passport office wasn't working. This, this young woman, um, Shakria, didn't have a passport <coughs> before the collapse, and so she couldn't get one. Um, even if they do have one, they can't get visas to the majority of countries. I mean, Afghans have one of the worst passports in the world when it comes to visa free, tr free travel. And that's actually deliberate. That's these, these visa laws are put in place to keep out asylum seekers, which the West doesn't want. So it's, it's very stark, the difference um, in treatment between the vast majority of refugees who need smugglers to escape and what's happening in Ukraine right now, which is, of course, good. People should be allowed to flee wars without having to resort to smugglers. Matt, before we uh, uh, go to the situation, the political situation in Afghanistan now and, of course, later your book, uh, if you could talk about the humanitarian crisis, as we said in the introduction, 75 uh, percent of Afghanistan's population has now fallen into acute poverty, five million Afghans uh, facing uh, acute malnutrition, and, and the UN Secretary General warning that, that the country was hanging by a thread. Uh, uh, could you talk about what you know of the causes of this crisis and what you think uh, needs to be done? Well, one thing we have to understand is that there's been a malnutrition, a poverty crisis in Afghanistan for a long time. Um, poverty and malnutrition actually got worse during the U.S. occupation. 
because of the conflict and because of the ineffectiveness of development and aid. But, of course, the collapse has made it far worse. You know, we, over 20 years, built the most aid-dependent state in the world, perhaps in history. And the sudden withdrawal of that aid has had predictable consequences. It's led to this near collapse of the government and um, a situation where people don't have enough to eat, where they're, in some cases, selling their children, uh, you know, in, in very young marriages in order to survive, where they're f fleeing across borders just to find jobs. So, that, so people are fleeing a catastrophe that we have direct responsibility for, but under the, you know, the refugee laws that, that we have today, that's not—that wouldn't count—that uh, that doesn't make them eligible for asylum. You know, someone fleeing starvation is not considered a refugee uh, in the classic definition of the term, the Geneva Convention of 1951. Um, and yet, that is absolutely what's driving a lot of Afghans to leave their country. You said, Matt, that uh, a humanitarian—a humanitarian crisis is not grounds for uh, Afghans or others seeking uh, uh, asylum, uh, refugee status. But in addition to the humanitarian crisis, there have been widespread reports of the Taliban cracking down on uh, uh, women, uh, women activists, uh, former members, uh, members of the former government, as well as on journalists. Uh, I mean, are those people still trying to uh, flee the country? They are. But, like I said, it's very difficult to leave. You know, people are facing risk of persecution. I have friends there. You know, every day I wake up to messages on my phone, people who are desperate to get out. It's, it's very, very difficult for them to get visas and leave. And once they do, even if they can get to a neighboring country, like Iran or Pakistan, they're looking at waiting years um, for, for refugee resettlement. But there's a lot of people who are trying to get them out. These are people who, who want to leave, who have people in the West who, who want to help them get out, support them. They're people we have a responsibility for um, due to our long involvement in the country and the, the mess we've left behind. And yet, again, because of visa restrictions, because of immigration laws, because of our, you know, man-made constraints, um, these people are trapped in a desperate situation. And so that's really, I think, what we should be aware of. And one of the things I wanted to, you know, explain in my book is just how much of this—the suffering and restrictions faced by refugees, faced by migrants, are the result of border policies, are the result of laws. And it, it really takes a case like Ukraine, where people are, are just leaving, you know, they're just getting in their car and driving to Poland, for us to see just how much of the suffering is, is actually unnecessary in places like Afghanistan. Let's take a deep dive into your book, because you tell the story so graphically. Uh, what happens to refugees, you know, those who are, quote, worth saving and those who aren't? Matthew Aiken's book is called The Naked Don't Fear the Water, An Underground Journey with Afghan Refugees. We have a rule on democracy now, Matt, and that is no sound bites. So you got to give us the whole meal here. Can you talk about the journey? you took, the obstacles, the horror people face when they're fleeing a desperate situation, which is what you could describe Afghanistan, the country, as over the last decades of the U.S. invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. Talk about your journey. Well, the story begins with my friend, whom I call Omar, in the book. And Omar was, you know, one of the first people I met in Afghanistan when I f went there, uh, shortly after I went there in 2008. He had grown up in exile. His parents fled the Soviets. You know, we have to remember Afghanistan has been at war for 40 years now, tragically. And they came back after 2001 full of hope for the future of their country, for this era of development and peace that the West had promised to Afghans after the U.S. invasion. And he became a translator with the American military. He was also working for uh, Canadians. He, he spoke English. Then he decided he wanted to work with journalists. So that's when we met. And we worked together for many years in the country while I was living in Afghanistan. I got to know his family as well. And like many Afghans, he dreamed of emigrating to the West. He actually applied for one of these um, special immigrant visas that the U.S. grants to 
employees, uh, local employees in Afghanistan and Iraq. He should have qualified, but because of all the paperwork restrictions, he was rejected. So this happened in 2015, when, as you probably recall, there was a migration crisis in Europe. A million people crossed the Mediterranean Sea. It was the largest movement of refugees in, in history in these little rubber rafts. So the borders in, open, in Europe opened briefly, and Omar thought, this is my chance to go. So he decided to take the smuggler's road to Europe in order to escape, and I decided to go with him. But the only way that I could do that was to go undercover as an Afghan refugee myself, um, because of the danger of being kidnapped or being arrested and separated. And because I, um, you know, have my, my, my mother's ancestors are Japanese, but I, I look Afghan and I speak Persian from living there for so many years. So I was able to do that. So the book is a story um, of our journey together through the migrant underground, to Europe. So talk about the journey you took. Talk about where you started with your friend Omar and what you faced. Well, it started in Kabul when he decided to go, and he was on the fence about leaving for a while because he'd fallen in love with, you know, um, a young woman, the neighbor's daughter. and. He didn't want to leave and, and risk losing her, but ultimately he realized that that was the only way his father, her father, who didn't want the marriage to happen, was going to give her, him her, her hand, because he needed to go and have something to show. He could, he could bring her legally to Europe, perhaps. So he made the decision to set off, um, and we, we traveled to the border, the same place I was last fall. You know, this is the Iranian border. It's a, it's a desert uh, between Iran and Afghanistan, and this is where migrants cross. It's a very dangerous journey, um, takes you through wild terrain controlled by drug smugglers and, and insurgents. So we ended up in a smuggler's safe house there, and there were many twists and turns, which I, I guess I shouldn't get into here, but eventually we found ourselves um, in Turkey, and then from Turkey we went to the coast again with smugglers. and. We were driven to the beach and deposited around midnight and told to get on board a little rubber raft. So there was about 40 people, uh, men, women and children, some of them Syrian, some Afghan, some African, but we were all together in this tiny boat that set off into the sea around midnight. And that was the, the crossing that, that many refugees made. Uh, in hopes of reaching safety on the Greek islands. Matt, you said that that Omar himself grew up in exile. He didn't grow up in Afghanistan. He and his family returned to Afghanistan uh, in 2001, after the Taliban were ousted. Where did he grow up? And then also explain the, uh, the role of smugglers. Uh, who they are and and the exorbitant sums they often charge uh, uh, people trying to flee. Yeah, they do. Um, they do often represent you know life savings for people. These these sums of money that they have to pay, and the more money you have, the safer your journey, um, and and the less money you have, the more risks you're you're forced to take. But the fact of the matter is, as I as I mentioned. Almost every refugee needs a smuggler because they're they're not allowed to cross borders. They 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 don't have they come from countries normally that uh, who, where, where that their passports don't allow them to travel. So smugglers are a necessity. They're often scapegoated for the migration crisis, but in reality, the they're the, they're they're created by borders. You know, the, the harsher a border is, the more difficult it is to cross, the more people are going to be willing to pay smugglers, the more of an economy it creates. And this is something Afghans have lived with for decades. You know, like I said, Omar grew up in Iran, and he and his family, you know, were, were also in Pakistan. They were on the move throughout his childhood, and very often they were crossing borders with the help of smugglers. And one of the things that I talk about in the book that, you know, in terms of history is 
how these borders have gotten more and more difficult to cross over time. So when they were fleeing the Soviets at that time, it was actually relatively easy to cross. In some places, you might just pay a small bribe to a border guard. But over the years, as, as neighboring countries have tried to keep out Afghan migrants, they've built walls, they've stepped up patrols, they've increased the violence of the borders, uh, that's just meant that people have to pay more and go further, take deeper detours into the uh, mountains. The bribes that are paid now have increased. The cost has increased. And yet, people are still crossing. And yet, you know, there's there's been a massive wave. You know, when I was on the border uh, this fall, we saw—I was told by the smugglers there that they've never seen this many people crossing. There was an estimate that maybe a million Afghans have crossed into Iran uh, this fall. So the border's don't keep people out. They don't keep desperate people from moving, but they do enrich smugglers. One of the things you exposed, Matt, was the drone strike at the very end, the last one that the world saw, because all the world's media was there, um, though that had happened many, many, many times before throughout Afghanistan, where there weren't witnesses, where there weren't journalists, uh, creating so many internal refugees, who then ultimately are the refugees who try to leave the country. And I wanted to connect it to something that just happened a few weeks ago in the Senate. In January, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing on the costs of 20 years of the U.S. drone strikes. The hearing began when the committee chair, Senator Dick Durbin, played a clip from Democracy Now! of a Yemeni victim of a U.S. drone strike. Among those who testified was Hina Shamsi, the director of National Security Project for the ACLU, which represents survivors of the August 29th drone strike in Kabul that you so well documented that killed 10 Afghan civilians. I've listened to fathers describe the horror of having to pick up the body parts of their children. I've listened to one of my clients struggle to breathe through her despair after the killing of her husband, an aid worker for an American NGO, and three of her sons, and one of her grandchildren. My client's grief is compounded by the fact that, for 19 days, our government kept up false allegations about their loved ones, wrongly asserting the strike was righteous and successful against ISIS operatives. The Pentagon later admitted its mistake, but the damage is done. Hina Shamsi's testimony drew an angry response from the South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, whose second biggest source of campaign contributions for his 2020 reelection campaign were employees of the major drone producer Lockheed Martin. This is Senator Graham. Afghanistan is a breeding ground for terrorism as I speak. Everybody that we work with is being slaughtered. And we want to talk about limiting, closing Gitmo and restricting the drone program. You're living in a world that doesn't exist. So that's Lindsey Graham lecturing Hina Shamsi. Matt, can you describe the world that does exist, as you saw it, with the U.S. drone strikes in Afghanistan? Well, yeah, I was there the next morning after this drone strike in Kabul, and I saw um, some, some body parts in the wreckage of the vehicle that the U.S. had destroyed inside a family home. Um, those, some of those body parts belong to the seven children who were killed in the strike. Um, and as you mentioned, this strike was one of many. You know, this was well documented because it happened in Kabul at a time when the world's attention was focused. But but there's countless strikes that have taken place in remote areas where people can't visit, and we just have the military's version um, of events. But, you know, the, the point is right now that we have a direct responsibility for what has happened in Afghanistan. Um, there's there's no easy solutions. Um, I don't think I don't think just sealing off the borders and and bombing them with drones is 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 in any way um, going to help the situation. And it's 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 not reflective of the responsibility we bear. We should be you know working to actively alleviate the humanitarian crisis as best we can. Instead, we're cutting off the Afghan central bank's funds and, and seizing it, saying we're going to distribute it to the 9-11 families. So I think people would just like to turn their backs on Afghanistan and, and, and forget about them. But the truth is that we have 
much more responsibility to for what Afghans are fleeing than Ukrainians, for example. No, and if you could explain that last point, um, it's one that we have focused on a lot. Uh, but this issue, if we could end on these sanctions against the money, uh, we had on a mother whose son was killed in the 9-11 attacks, uh, Phyllis Rodriguez, and she said, not in her son's name. Does she want the people, the sons and daughters of Afghanistan to suffer, as her family has suffered losing him? This point of of the sanctions put on the aid to Afghanistan um, that is preventing the people of Afghanistan from getting their money? What we've done is we've frozen the deposits that the Afghan Central Bank had in, in U.S. banks, and that has completely crippled the financial system and exacerbated the, the, the terrible crisis that's happening in the country. And, uh, you know, to, 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 to seize this money and say you're going to distribute it to the 9-11 families, to me, is, is not only cruel, but illogical, because this money doesn't belong to the Taliban, right? It, it, it belongs to the Afghan people. If we don't recognize the Taliban as a legitimate government of Afghanistan, which we haven't, then, um, then it's not their money. But it's clearly a policy that's being done for domestic reasons, for, for, for domestic political reasons. And I think it is um, sadly representative of an administration that clearly um, is not thinking about Afghans first.